Good morning and welcome everyone. This is from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. In verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That includes you and I this morning. So me, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises i'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Well, good morning, everyone. So thanks so much for coming out to start our week together with one another, with the Lord at the center of our mind and in our hearts as we come together to worship our Maker. So for those of us who are here today, you know, uh, you've got an opportunity to, to greet one another. So certainly that's a good thing for us. And for those of you who are joining us remotely, we're just glad that you're here. In the COVID era, we've made some changes so that we can accommodate all of our needs without having to handle and touch things that aren't necessary or essential to do that way. And so as a result of that, a lot of what it is that we're doing now um, enables us to communicate electronically. So um, on the screen are a number of things that are available to us that we can do now electronically. So if you are new or visiting with us today, you can send the text message Orange View, one big word, to 94000. And that will give some information about the church here. If you'd like a copy of our church bulletin, you're able to text the word OV Weekly, one big word, to that 94000. That will give you a link where you can download that. If you have a prayer need of some kind or anything you'd like to get to the leadership of the congregation, you can text that message to OVCOMCARD, and what that will do is it will bounce back to you a form that you can then fill out and then pass along your prayer need. And then lastly, a very, very important element is a chief mission of our congregation is to help people become right with God in the first place through obedience to the gospel. And so if you would like information on that, you can text OV, I'm ready, one big word, to 94,000, and then that will give you some information about becoming a Christian, what's involved in that, uh, belief and repentance and confession and baptism and all of those things related. And it'll give you an opportunity to explore some things if you've got some stuff kind of holding you back or that you'd like more information on. So I would really strongly encourage you to do that if that is of interest to you. That's not the only route for you, though. You can mention that interest to any member here, and you can certainly mention that interest to me, and then we will help you in any way that we can. Um, also, related to COVID, we don't pass uh, any kind of communion trays or things, so you're going to need to get a communion kit. Now, your communion kit might look like the one that I'm holding here in my hand. It's got fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread in it, or it may be like the one that's there on the screen. But you're going to need one of these in about 15 minutes or so for the communion segment. So if you need to excuse yourself to go grab one, there's some in the back of the auditorium as well as where you came into the auditorium. And then if you're watching us remotely or by live stream, you'll want to make sure you have your implements there on your side. But we'll go ahead now and we'll have our opening prayer and then we'll jump back into our song service. 
Our Heavenly Father, as we come today to worship you, help us to open our hearts and take what Michael has said to us to heart. Also, Heavenly Father, we're mindful of Christians all over the world that are having difficulties um, meeting and worshiping you, and in some cases, um, risking their life. Be with them. Be with us. Thank you for sending your son that we have the hope of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. To me, Lord, the people praise you, lift you up and raise you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Lord, the people love you. Place nobody above you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Sing holly, holly, hallelujah. All the glory is due. You are the Holy One, you're the one, you're the only one, bless your name, Lord Jesus, the only name that frees us, you are the Holy One, you're the one, you're the only one, we will praise you right here and now. Rocks and hills cry out. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Sing holly, holly, hallelujah. All the glory is due you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. thousand tongues we would praise you with everyone you are the holy one you're the one you're the only one if we had ten thousand hands we would raise them as you command you are the holy one you're the one you're the only one sing holly holly hallelujah all the glory is due you you are the holy one you're the one you're the only one sing holly holly All the glory is due you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. To, to me. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. 
Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. <coughs> Sing praises to the Lord. O oh, you his saints, give thanks to his holy name. Do <laughs> I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love all of mankind as you would love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and love all mankind. We've got Christian lives to live. We've got Jesus love to give. We've got nothing to fear because our Savior is near. We've got Christian lives to live. We've got Jesus love to give. We've got nothing to fear because our Savior is near love. The Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and love all mankind love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love all of mankind as you would love yourself love I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here I am, I don't have much to bring, but here's my heart, and I lay it at your feet. Draw it near, your presence and throne above. Hear its praise of your never-ending love. You are my Lord, you are my King. The sacrifice of song I bring. I offer it up to you. My God most high, these humble hands I lift to you in praise and thanks for all you do. Here I am, hear my heart, my God most high. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God is love. Love bears all things be.
love. God is 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 love. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, all thy strength, all thy mind. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, for God is love, God is love, God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What a wonderful, merciful Savior we have. Oh, me, wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost our way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. No. Righteous men, Son of God, sent as David's heir, granted all the earth, exalted, seen with blinded eyes, met with wicked heart. Son of God, worshiped with content, thrown upon a cross, exalted, scorned by those who walk, loved within belief, Son of God, born to take my death, Jesus, Son of God, exalted, You know, someone told me one time that they felt like Christians were arrogant and we thought that we were special, that we were better than they were. And that was just kind of always the perception that they had had. And I hope that all of us are, are careful not to give people that impression. Because when we come together and, and we partake of these emblems, you know, we don't do it because... We're better than anyone. You know, we do it because we're just like they are. We're sinners. We've all fallen short 
for the glory of God. You know, Martin Luther once said, we are all mere beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. We're not smarter. We're not better. We're certainly not more worthy. It's just that we've been blessed to understand what's been done for us. You know, we realize how lost we were, how hopeless we were, and how all of that changed at the cross. I'd like to read a little bit from Isaiah chapter 6. And before I do, remember who Isaiah was at this point. I mean, Isaiah was the prophet of Israel. He was probably the most righteous person in the whole world at that time. Everybody looked up to Isaiah. I'm sure Isaiah thought to himself that he was a pretty good guy. You know, when he looked around and he saw all the sin, he probably felt pretty good about where he was with God. But this is what Isaiah writes about his experience. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One glimpse of the Lord. And Isaiah was just shattered. He was humbled more than he knew he could be. He says, woe is me. I am undone. He's before the creator of this universe. And in that presence, you know, he's exposed for what he is. He was destroyed. As he put it, he was undone. He suddenly realized how unworthy he was to be there, to be in the presence of God. And just like Isaiah, not one of us is worthy to be with God, to be in his presence. God's perfect. No, he's holy. When you have a being like that, how can he live with imperfection, with, with people like us that are full of sin, that are selfish, that so far below him. But our God is, is a God of mercy. You know, he's a God of compassion. He's not willing that any should perish, but that we should all have eternal life. And that's why he sent Jesus. In 2 Corinthians verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 19, the Apostle Paul writes, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He goes on in verse 21 to say, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because of Christ, we don't have to feel like Isaiah when he was before the Lord. We don't have to feel undone. We don't have to be scared, frightened. We don't have to feel guilty of our sins. 
Because of Christ, our sins are washed away. It's Christ that makes us different than the world. Because belief in Christ gives us the ability to be in the presence of that perfect and holy God that we all long to see. We've been justified. We've been redeemed. And it's God's presence that we were created to be in. And it's through Christ's sacrifice, his resurrection, and the life that he led that allows that to happen. And so at this time, as we partake of the emblems, think about those things. And let's think about the magnitude of that sacrifice, what that means for us. Go ahead and uh, take your bread out, and I'll go ahead and say a prayer for that. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now thanking you for that sacrifice of your Son and our Savior, and we realize that we don't deserve you, and we don't deserve that sacrifice, and yet it was done for us anyway. And we realize that our only hope is in you and in Christ. As we partake of this bread now, we know that it represents the fact that Jesus was all human, that he felt pain the way we feel pain. He was scared the way we get scared. And it helps us to remember the great sacrifice that, that was made for us. So be with us this time as we partake that. In Christ's name, amen. We'll say another prayer for the Jews. Heavenly Father, as we continue to remember Christ's sacrifice, we pray that you would bless this juice. It, it reminds us of the blood that was shed. We have been told by you that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so we remember that moment, Lord, where you were willing to shed your own blood for us, even though we're unworthy. And we thank you for that. Forgive us, Lord, of those sins and help us to concentrate on that moment now as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. So that brings us to the point of our service where in just a moment... We'll have a brief break. We'll have a five-minute timer that'll count down for us. Now, one of the things that happens during this time is it gives you an opportunity to interact with one another, so we certainly encourage you to do that. Um, if you wanted to get a copy of the bulletin, I'll remind you that, again, you can obtain a digital copy of that by texting OV Weekly, one big word, to 94000. That will bounce back a link where you can download that and have immediate access to it as an electronic product. But if you would like to get a uh, print copy of it, I'll have them up here in the front that I'll be distributing along with some other things. So feel free to come on up here and I'll give you one of those print bulletins as well. Now, another one of the things that I'll distribute is what we call a kid's pack. Now, the kid's pack is an instructional packet that's designed to teach the sermon content to the younger element of the congregation through like word puzzles and coloring and things like that. They're custom made every week to go directly to the sermon content and they are educational. So if you have a younger tot that would like to get one of those, come on up here to the front and receive one of those from me as well. Now, another opportunity for you is that in the lobby, we have the ability to write out note cards that can be sent to other members of our congregation. Now, we're like 30 years into COVID now, I think. So um, maybe not quite that long, but feels like it sometimes. And a number of our congregation have been away because of concerns, uh, health-related because of COVID and such like that. So this does give you an opportunity to kind of stay in touch with them. So uh, feel free to use this time to go out, grab one of the cards, and fill out your content on the inside. And then on the outside, just put the member's name that you want it to go to, and that's it. You don't need to do anything else. Someone else will come along, they'll retrieve that, they'll address it, they'll put the postage on it, and throw it in the mail for you. So it's, it's designed to minimize your role to, to doing nothing more than just expressing your care or concern. You might even offer, you know, say, hey, we, we miss you, we'd love to have you back as soon as you're able. 
Um, maybe offer to give them a ride or whatever if that might be necessary as well. And then after you've done that and sealed it up, just throw it in that box that says outgoing mail. And again, someone else will take care of it. But that's it for the, the break announcements. I'm going to go ahead now. We'll start the timer and we'll see you all back in five minutes. If you want some of the stuff from me, come up and get it. Thanks a bunch. Welcome back. God, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. So good to me, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all jeez when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you pick my cup you are my all in all jesus lamb Our study that we began a few weeks ago on life in Babylon. If you have your Bible and you want to flip over to Daniel chapter 6, that's going to be our text today, a very well-known passage out of the book of Daniel. In fact, it's the one that most people think of when they think of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16, it says this, then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for our time we have to be together as a congregation this morning and the ability to look back into the life of Daniel and how it is that you worked with him as he stood against a very worldly world around him and demonstrated his continual commitment of righteous living and walking with you. We pray, Lord, that we would do the same. So we pray as we spend time here in Daniel chapter 6, looking at Daniel's encounter with the lion's den, that we would extract from this the things that are there, that we might be strengthened in our faith and in our walk with you, as we often find ourselves today also standing against our culture. We thank you for your care and pray you'd be with us always. In Christ's name, amen. So um, at this point in the story of Daniel, we started off the story in Daniel chapter 1, where Daniel was just a little, little guy, you know, probably a teenager or something. But at this point in Daniel's life, he is probably in his 80s. Uh, there was an actor by the name of John Barrymore who said, a man is not old until, he, until regrets take the place of dreams. 
And that is certainly not true with Daniel. Um, He is a man of great integrity and great righteousness and continues to walk together with the Lord. Uh, This last week I came across a story that said that one, one day a wife said to her husband, you used to hold my hand. And so he reached out and he held her hand. And then she said, you used to kiss me all the time. And so he reaches over and pecks her on the the cheek. And she said, you used to nibble on the back of my neck. And then her husband got up and just walked away. And she said, well, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get my teeth. Um, Growing old can have challenges. But when you're committed to the Lord, growing old just gives you the opportunity to look back at your life and see the opportunities that you've had and the experiences that you've had in walking together with the Lord. Now, with Daniel, the reality is he had a lot of persecution. And that's what happens to righteous people who are living in a worldly environment. Uh, When you look at Daniel and his three other friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they seem to be going from the frying pan into the lion's den. And I, I hate to tell you that a lot of Christians today never have to really worry about that. And it's not because there aren't lion's dens and fiery furnaces. It's because they don't do the things that are necessary to get cast into either one. Rather than standing in defiance against an ungodly environment, too often people are willing to compromise, and they will adapt to living in that world. In order to be cast into the lion's den or thrown into the furnace, you have to be willing to stand up when everyone else bows down and to bow down when everybody else says to stand up. And that's what these people do throughout Daniel. And so here we are today in 2022 in a world that is becoming more and more hostile to Christians today. I really tell you, it is not in your interest as a man or woman walking with God to compromise your faith or integrity, but instead to stand strong and stand fast against the Lord and just trust God to get you through it. Now, as we come to this passage in Daniel chapter 6, we see the same kinds of traits we've seen before in this, and I'd like to start off by taking a look at the character that was displayed by Daniel. You know, there was a uh, professional football team, the Dallas Cowboys, when they were forming up, that the owners of that team decided that what they would do in picking their management staff was to go to the successful corporations of their day and find out what they chose and looked for in the people that would be leading their organizations. So they went to like the Fortune 500 companies. They went to General Motors and Xerox and IBM, and they asked them, what is it that you look for in the people who will be leading your organization? And every single time, they always gave the same thing, character and integrity. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, is a man of incredible character and integrity. And as a result of that, found himself in a place of leadership within the nation. So Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, said that the kingdom was divided up into 120 satraps. And within those, they put over another little leader. And the leader would then be divided up so that there would be three primary individuals. And Daniel, according to verse 3, was going to take the spot above the whole thing. So in Daniel 6 and verse 3, it says, Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and the satraps because he was excellent in spirit. Um, And as a result of this, the king put him over the whole kingdom. And as oftentimes happens, this caused a reaction in his peers. And the reaction was jealousy. So jealousy rears its head, and as a result, his enemies come to him to scrutinize Daniel to find some way in which they can accuse him and bring him down so that they can then be elevated in the position that he was at. The problem with Daniel, for them, was that he had no skeleton in the closet. There was no Watergate for Daniel. Daniel was a man who was identified here as being effectively faultless. He had an incredible attitude. If you look at verse 3, verse 3 says that he had an excellent spirit within him. His work ethic was absolutely without parallel. In verse 4, it says that with regard to the kingdom, they could find no ground for complaint. You know, that should be true of us too, right? So godly men and women today should be the best employee any company ever has. Our work ethic should be astronomical. The scriptures tell us that we work as if unto the Lord. We should always be the best employee. Daniel was. He was a man of incredible righteousness. The text tells us again in Daniel chapter 4 that he was faithful and there was no error or any fault that was found in him. He was a man of integrity. 
a man of character, a man committed to righteous living, and he wasn't about to compromise even if it was necessary for his own personal benefit. In the folklore of the South, there's a story of a farmer who took a wagon full of cotton over to the cotton mill for it to be sold. And the cotton mill owner uh, was throwing all the cotton up on the scale and noticed that the farmer himself stood on the scale. Well, that increased the amount of the weight, and the man who owned the mill saw what happened, but he didn't say anything about it. He just wrote out the check to the farmer for the full amount of the scales and then said, John, you sold yourself for a dollar and 37 cents today. You should be careful about whether you put yourself for sale. If you compromise your integrity, if you compromise your character, if you compromise your honesty, you are giving your price. It is imperative that, as the saying goes, you practice what you preach. If you commit to a life of righteousness and you talk about a life of righteousness, you better live a life of righteousness. Daniel did. So a command comes down. And here's what it is in verse 5. These jealous people who are out to destroy Daniel, they come to him and say, well, we're not going to find any fault in him against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And so they pass a law. And here's what the law is. It's there on the screen, verses 6 and 7. What the law says is, hey, we've got a great idea. Let's pass a rule that says that no one can pray to any God except you, O king. And if they do, we will cast them into a den of lions. A long time ago, there used to be a TV show called Queen for a Day, where a person could become the queen for the day, and she'd be given all kinds of rights and privileges and prizes and things like that. And, and King Darius had himself as God for a day, or God for a month, really. The people could still pray as long as they prayed to him. And so that is, in fact, what happens. The king establishes a law, and the law is said, nobody can pray except to the king for 30 days. And it was passed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which meant that once the law was passed, it could not be changed. Here's the thing on that. Historically, there are two ways that a kingdom can do this. One is what in Latin is known as rex lex, which is the king is law. He just makes up the rules as he goes. But then there's another standard that is lex rex, which is the law is king. And in that standard, even the king has to obey the law. That was the rule of the Medes and the Persians. Once the law is passed, it is set. So what has now happened is ungodly people in charge have created an ungodly law that everyone must follow. And that was their government. Now let me just pause for a minute and say this. This is precisely the reason why we need godly people in government. Precisely that reason. Not just conservative people, godly people. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul told to Timothy and said that prayer should be made for people who are kings and those who are in high positions, and the reason why, that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And I assure you, it is hard to live a peaceful life if government is constantly making laws that Christians are expected to obey that violate standards of the Lord. And as a result of that, again, for Daniel, he found himself in that exact position. Because now he's being told, you can't pray for a month unless you pray to a man. Daniel's not going to do that. So his doom is essentially sealed at this point. So what's Daniel to do? A law has been passed. Isn't he obligated to follow the law? Let me pause on this for a minute. Please note that just because something is legal and lawful does not make it moral. Even if you stay within our country in the 1800s, race-based slavery was lawful. It was not moral. In the 1900s, segregation was legal, but it was not moral. In our age, we have legalized abortion. We have legalized prostitution. We have legalized all kinds of sin. It does not make it moral. 
Saying that something is lawful, therefore it is moral, would be like saying something is natural, therefore it's healthy regarding food. And just a reminder, arsenic is natural, okay? Just because it's lawful does not make it moral. Daniel has a law that's been passed, and now Daniel has to decide what it is he's going to do with it. Daniel looks at the law that says you cannot pray for a month and got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to his God as he had done previously. It did not change his behavior one bit. If there is a conflict between the law of God and the law of man, God's law wins. We are to obey the law, but not at the cost of disobeying God. In Acts chapter 5, the early Christians were given a command by the Jewish council, which was essentially a government agency. And here's what it is on the screen, Acts 5 verse 27. We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, in the name of Jesus. But here you are, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In response to that, Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. Hey, if government outlaws Christianity... I'm still going to be a Christian. And any man or woman who is committed to the Lord will do the same. He did not compromise in any way. He did not compromise one bit. But I'll tell you some of the ways that he might have been tempted to compromise. He might have been tempted to say, I'll just pray in secret. Or I will pray silently. Or maybe even to say, hey, I'm 80 years old. I've done this three times a day for my whole life. Just 30 days of not doing it won't hurt much. But he would not. He stood firm. And with that, he demonstrated a tremendous amount of courage. In verses 11 through 13, the story picks up. These men come before the king and say, Hey, we have found Daniel making a petition and plea before God. O king, we have a guy out here who does not follow your rule. Your rule says if anybody prays to anything, anyone except you for 30 days, they'd be cast into a den of lions. And therefore, this is a law that cannot be revoked. Daniel has done this. He makes a petition to his God three times a day. And now the stage is set for actual real-life persecution. Question. Is Christian persecution in this country just around the corner? Is it coming? Okay, I'll report, you decide. National Association of Evangelicals took a survey of church leaders in the United States. They found 32% of them said that they had already been persecuted for their Christian faith. 76% said they expect that they will be persecuted in the years ahead. Our world's changing. George Yancey who's a professor of sociology at Baylor University, researched the issue of whether Christians are actually being persecuted in this country or if they just think they're being persecuted. And so he sent out a questionnaire, open-ended, to a group of progressive activists and asked their opinion on Christians. Here's what they said. Here's what they said about you. One guy said, kill them all. Let their God sort them out. Or this one. A torturous death would be too good for them. Or this one. I'd be a bit giddy and certainly grateful if everyone who saw himself or herself in that category were snatched permanently from our societal peripheries, whether by holocaust or rapture or plague. Or this one. I am only too aware of their horrific attitudes and beliefs, and those are enough to make me see them as subhuman. Those are your peers. That's what real people think about real Christians in America today. I'll report, you decide. But I'll tell you, our world's changing. Daniel finds himself on the receiving end of the wrath of government because the law has been passed. And it is a law that cannot be changed. So the king commanded in verse 16 that Daniel was to be brought and cast into the lion's den. And he was. And as Daniel was cast into the lion's den, my image is that he went in without fear, but went in with a lot of courage. 
In Proverbs 3, 25 says, Don't be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will keep your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Trust in the Lord. And he did. And let me just also point out to you that the Lord did not save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved Daniel in the lion's den. These days, it might be a little peculiar for you not to be persecuted in some way, or at least not to see it coming. There was a German Christian who stood up to the Nazis during World War II. He was thrown into prison. The chaplain of the prison went to go see him and said, Brother, why are you in this jail cell? And the man responded back and said, Brother, why are you not in this jail cell? When a man stands firm to his convictions before God, it sometimes comes with high cost. Daniel stood his ground. And here's what he said in verses 18 and following. The king went spent the night fasting, trying to wait and see what goes on, and then runs down to see what it is that happened. He says, Oh, Daniel, has the Lord delivered you from the lions? Here's what it says in verse 22. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. Daniel went into that lion's den, and a literal angel of God rescued him. It happens a lot in Scripture. Psalm 34 and 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. And I'll assure you that the Scriptures from Genesis through maps depict God as a deliverer. My absolute favorite passage on this is found in 2 Kings 6. It's the account of Elisha. Elisha was being pursued by the king of Syria, who decided that Elisha was a danger to him and had to be destroyed. So in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 13, the king says, Go and find out where Elisha is that I might go and seize him. And they said, Oh, well, he's down in Dothan, and he sent there a great army to go get him. So an army's on the way. And then verse 15 says, When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, behold, there's an army with horses and chariots all around the city. And he goes over to Elisha and says, There's an army out there. What are we supposed to do? Here's what Elisha said. Don't be afraid. There are more with us than with them. And I'm sure the servant looked around and said, There's just you and me, some horses over here. I think we're outnumbered. In response to this, Elisha prayed that his eyes might be opened, and his eyes were opened. And what did he see? Behold, he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is what happens when God intervenes to protect his people. It's a fascinating account. Elisha could stand against the king of Syria and defy him in obedience to God. And if the king of Syria said, oh yeah, you and what army has answered be me and the Lord's army? Daniel could do the same thing to Darius. And the Lord delivered him too. Unless you be thinking, yeah, well, these are all from the Jewish scriptures. That doesn't really apply to us. I want to remind you of Hebrews 1.14. That says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve for the sake of those who inherit salvation. That's you. You have an incredible ally as you stand against a world that's against you. And the Lord still shuts the mouths of lions. There's no telling what form that lion might take for you. I mean, there really isn't. There are lots of things that could be cast against you. It could be financial, it could be relational, it could be physical. There could be all kinds of things, but your trust should remain in the Lord. Jesus told the disciples that were kind of worried about what was going to happen to them, to fear not, for I have overcome the world. That's your ally. God told Paul, my grace is sufficient. Trust in the Lord's grace. So Daniel finds himself in a position where he's delivered by God, and the text even tells us why. Because he had trusted in his God. I don't think we have to go looking for lion's dens, but you don't have to run from them when they show up. Continue, again, to trust in the Lord. I assure you, the Lord will be there for you. Okay, let's pray together. 
Lord, we thank you for the examples of righteous men and women in Scripture, such as Daniel that we've read about here in Daniel 6, who had strength and courage and trust and belief in you to get through some of the most challenging things you could imagine being subjected to. And we pray that as we live in our modern Babylon today, that we would look to you for strength and comfort as well, that we would have the courage to stand in defiance if necessary against ungodly law and continue to walk with you and be committed with you. We thank you for all of your care. We pray you'd be with us always. In Christ's name. And oh, so me, over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? You are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Well, I do want to give you guidance concerning giving. There are lots of ways to do that. Passing a collection plate is not one of them, but here's what we do have. So you're certainly able to give electronically. I think most of our members do, in fact, use this as their method of giving. You can go to the congregation's webpage at followthebible.com. Just scroll down to the bottom where there's a big uh, green button that says click here for online giving. You can click there and go through that process. If you would prefer to do that by text messaging, you can text the word GIVE to the number on the screen, 714-450-7010. That will enable you to make a, uh, a contribution at that point. And then some people choose to do their giving by mail. And so the address for the congregation is, again, there on the screen, 13211 Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California, 92843. Now, giving, of course, is an opportunity and an act of worship. So um, while we're here today on the church campus, you may choose to, to worship God in that way through these various means that we've given. And then another way that you can worship the Lord with your giving is tangibly here through the collection boxes that are located at the exits out of the auditorium. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to do that as well. I do want to remind you that if you're new or visiting with us today, we'd sure like to know so if you just text the word Orange View, one big word, to that 94,000 number, that will give the church here an opportunity to introduce ourselves to you, and then you can share with, what, with us whatever information about yourself you'd like to do. So if you have a prayer need of some kind, you can give us that. Um, if you give us like an address and such, we'll be happy to send you a card. In fact, we'd love to be able to do that, and thank you for coming out to being with us. Um, in the week ahead, we do have some Bible study opportunities going on. We have a Tuesday morning group. Although we've still got a lot of illness going on in that class, so we will not be meeting this week. Okay, So our Tuesday morning will not meet this week, um, but our Tuesday evening class will. And our Tuesday evening group is done online. Uh, it's, we're doing a study of good and evil. This week deals with James chapter 5 and illness. Love to have you join us. You can go to the church's webpage, followthebible.com. There's a click right there on that page to join that Bible study group. Just click that and voila, you'll be in, and that would be terrific. Um, also want to remind you that a primary mission of this congregation is to help other people become Christians as well. So if that's something that you would be interested in, we would really love to help you do that. Um, you can text the word OV, I'm ready, one big word, to that 94,000 number. That would be one avenue. Another is you can mention that interest to any member here. Any member here can help you with it. And then a third option is you can certainly come and talk to me. Um, so I'll be out at the reception area when we're all done here, and you can come over and say, okay, I'm game. 
uh, tell me more, and I would be happy to do that. But let's go ahead now. I'm going to close this up in a word of prayer, and we'll be finished for this morning. Lord, we thank you again for our opportunity to be together in worship. We've got brothers and sisters in Christ that are here. It gives us a great opportunity to encourage one another in the Lord, so thank you for that. And we pray that as we go forward from this place back out into the world, that we would fulfill our role of being light and being salt and allowing your greatness to shine through our life. We pray that we'd keep our eyes open for opportunities to do good to all men as we see those opportunities to do. And that we would not do so silently, but use that as an opportunity to talk about how it is that we've allowed the Lord to work through us and to give you the, the, the glory and the credit for that. We thank you for, again, all of the blessings that we enjoy in life, and we know that all that is good comes from you. So for that, again, we give thanks. We pray, Lord, for the courage of our congregation to stand up against a world that's often hostile to them. And we pray that you would strengthen us in our resolve, again, to walk with you consistently and earnestly and without any compromise. Thank you again for all your care. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much. Have a joyous week.